to everybody's got a favorite fairy tale, right? So you think about back in the good old days, Goldilocks and the three bears. And if you remember the, the gist of the story is she was, she was caught eating some porridge and some of it was too hot. Some of it was too cold. Some of it was just right. It's kind of like our industry. When you think about it, when you go to any market throughout North America, where I travel, we find contractors that kind of fit into one of three categories, right? So instead of it being Goldilocks and the three bears, it is drum roll, Ben, Goldilocks and the three bids, right? So I got people that are too high, I got people that are too low, and I got people that are just right, right? So if we think about that idea, that fairy tale of being too hot, too cold, just right, if we think about proactive versus reactive, what Ben talked about in the opening was he talked about customers being proactive versus contractors being proactive. And they're actually just the opposite to a degree. So proactive contractors are looking at things in a different way. And we want to talk a little bit about proactive pricing here. This guy, Elliot Ross from Harvard Business Review, wrote an article and talked about set, uh, setting prices as a real inexact science. I, I know because I've been working with contractors for over 20 years and helping them set prices on their service and replacement jobs. And it is an inexact science. There's math involved, depending on the contractor. I know my grandfather's method of pricing was uh, take the cost of the equipment times three, and that's what I sell it for installed, okay? Pretty simple for a, a guy that didn't really go to uh, great lengths to learn job costing and stuff like that and raised a family of five using that method. So I guess it worked okay back in the day. But the interesting thing is one of the things that Elliot talks about in his article is he says, this is one of the least understood parts of business. Even though it's one of the most important parts of business, it's one of the least understood. And when you think about proactive pricing, what you're trying to do as a business person is you're trying to say, okay, what's coming down the pipe? What's happening in the future? What things do we see with our customers, with the market, with our rivals, you know, our competitors in the market? What are they doing that's going to have some sort of an impact on my price? Now, I will say this. I don't really care personally, what my competition is selling stuff for, because in my mindset, and I've just got a different mindset, I know than a lot of people, there is no competition. If you're doing the very best you can, and you're applying all the principles that you know, to deliver the safest, healthiest, most comfortable and energy efficient system possible, and your business is standing on two principles, one of quality, the other of integrity. If you're doing those things, you don't really have competition. You may have other people in the same trade in your market, but they're not competing with you because once you get that customer and you own that customer, there is no competition because they're not paying attention to anybody else. So a proactive pricer, when you think about anticipation, they're adjusting their processes as they go along. They no longer use their granddaddy's way to do things. They start looking at different ways to do things to better prepare for future outcomes. That's what we're all about here. When you think about proactive pricing, what we're saying is don't continue doing it the way you've always done it just because you've always done it that way. Things are changing and you need to change along with it. So one of the things you should do is look at it through the eyes of your customer. And when you look at it through the eyes of your customer, if you really study how other industries calculate and present their prices, and you apply what they do in your business, you're actually doing things, you're actually staying in line with the way consumers purchase today. So if we're selling to consumers, why not pay attention to the way that consumers buy from other suppliers in the market? So if you think about a restaurant, I mean, the first thing they do when you sit down at the table at a restaurant is they hand you their price book, right? Some people call it a menu, but it's, it's just a retail price book for product that they deliver. It's pre-priced. It's already got a, a bill of materials associated with it. It's already got a process associated with making the meal. 
all of those components, just like we have for putting in a furnace or putting in a condenser, or putting in an evaporator, installing a thermostat, all of the pieces and parts have been thought about, they've been planned for ahead, they've got all the materials back there in the kitchen to be able to put it together, and they got a process that works most of the time, right? As long as they've got the training and so forth going on. But the point is that industry pre-calculates their price and puts it on a menu and hands it to the customer. Okay, what about automobile industry? What, what can we learn about how they do what they do? Well, their big deal is bundling. Right. I mean, you can buy four tires from an automobile dealer, but it would be very expensive. Right. But what they do is they put all the components together into one package based on what they've learned about their customers. So they put a guy, a guy that wants a sports package. They know, yeah, that guy's probably going to want a sunroof. He's probably going to want some low profile tires. He's probably going to want to have a, a noisy exhaust system. He's probably going to want to have a slap shifter, right? He's putting together the manufacturer in this case is putting together a bundle of products that go together to solve customer desires, right? To fit the desires of the customer. So the automobile industry is sitting there saying, hmm, if we bundle this stuff together, customers will actually probably buy more of the stuff that we do because we're paying attention to their wants and their needs. So the restaurant industry is giving us a menu. The automobile industry is giving us bundling. What about the airline industry? I mean, right now I feel really bad for them because their capacity is, is gone, basically. I mean, they got, they got no planes in the air for the most part. And, uh, and it's hurting, it's hurting them a lot. But when they're up and running, think about all the seats on that airplane, right? They gotta have a certain number of seats filled up on that airplane in order for them to make any kind of profit. And so what they do is they price those seats based on capacity and based on what's going on in the market. So a lot of different variables go in, fuel prices impact things, Holidays impact things. If you don't believe that, try to get an airline ticket right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> you better get it real early while the prices are lower so they can get that plane filled up because when you wait to the last minute, man, that gets expensive. And then what about hotels? Same kind of thing. Try to go to Disney once everything's back up. Try to go to Disney right in the middle of the summer and see what you pay for the same exact hotel room that you could get in the spring when nobody's coming down there right? It's a big deal. So pay attention to what people are doing in other industries and learn how to apply it in your own business. So let's talk about menus. A menu could be a, something as simple as a printed price page, right? As, which is all the restaurants use for the most part. Yeah, there's some digital menus out there, but for a lot of people, they just maybe have a printed price page that gives choices. But the key here is to present choices in a logical way. Now, this is a pretty busy price page to be sure, but it's got lots of choices for the customer to consider, right? Customers are used to buying from a menu. Let's look at the next one. So you might wanna simplify things. You might wanna make it a little easier. And again, don't be stuck in the old ways your granddad did things. Look at different options that are out there available for you to make it easy for customers to buy from you, to put things in bundles so that they don't have to think about a bunch of details, right? Let's look at the next one. And then finally, one thing you wanna really focus on is making sure that you've got your financing options available. Again, you're giving customers choices. We know they want choices. What do they think? I gotta get three prices. Well, why can't they get all three prices from you? Right? Why do you have to send them to your competition to get the other two prices? You don't, right? I was dumb enough when I went to work for my dad that when someone told me, well, we always, I asked the power company, what are your recommendations? They said, well, we always recommend people get three prices. I said, okay. So I built a pricing system so they could get three prices from us. Because if they got prices from other people, I knew they weren't going to get the safest, healthiest, most comfortable and energy efficient system possible. And I wanted to make sure that I did not dissatisfy my customer by letting them go to work with a guy that didn't know how to do that. Because I knew I had the right team. 